Greetings people, I am Lucifer Seraph. Please allow me a few minutes to correct myself. During the last episode, I made this statement. Something I haven't mentioned yet. The bonus stages aren't random. To enter a specific bonus stage, you must have a certain number of rings. After reviewing the video and revisiting my information sources, I soon realized that this statement is not 100% accurate. Now, don't get me wrong, you still need the required amount of rings to enter each bonus stage, but there is still a random element to the bonus stage you receive. For example, say you have 45 rings. This is enough to access the slot machine or the anti-gravity stages, but not enough to access the gumball machine. Meaning, if you pass a star post, there's a 50% chance of being taken to either the slot machine or the anti-gravity stages. Now say you have 100 rings. That means there is a 33.333 recurring percent chance of being sent to any of the three bonus stages. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. Mistakes do happen and I hope this clears everything up. If not, tough. I don't want to do any more maths. Anyway, welcome to the flying battery zone. This level's gimmick? I've got no idea. You'd think it'd be some kind of aerial fortress, but this place is such a maze of floating platforms, loops, pitfalls and centrifugal nonsense that you completely forget you're inside a huge blimp. Anyway, let's start describing stuff. These monkey bars are common in both acts, and aside from showing off a few new frames of animation for your character, they provide a convenient way to bypass certain obstacles, such as robots, spinning flamethrowers and pitfalls. Speaking of flames, the flame shield is a must for this level. The flamethrowers, which I'll get to in a moment, are a common hazard, so acquiring a flame shield should be your top priority. Your second priority should be avoiding pitfalls. Not a major obstacle and nowhere near as common, but dangerous nonetheless. Back to the flamethrowers, they hurt you, obviously. But stand on top of one, and the build-up of pressure will propel you into the air giving them a secondary use of delayed springboard. Centrifugal tubes can be found almost everywhere. The vertical ones are used to help you reach higher portions of the level, while the horizontal ones act like a spinning corridor. All in all, nothing to worry about. These orange and blue balls can be stood on and used as a makeshift platform. This area can be difficult with Knuckles since he can't jump as high as Sonic or Tails. Otherwise this area should be easy, just try not to get crushed. You know those animal prisons? The ones you break open, releasing the local wildlife, thus completing the stage? Well, the flying battery is where they come from! Sadly, however, not all of them in this stage contain cute little animals. I'll go into how you can spot the difference later, but for now we have spinny propeller thingies to discuss. Run close to these things and Sonic grabs onto them automatically. Pressing jump sends you to the right. Holding down left and pressing jump sends you to the left. The spinning blades will hurt you. And the non-spinning blades are simply a result of fraps not syncing with the in-game sprites and will hurt you as well. This is the only time you encounter these things, so once you're past, continue forward to encounter the level's next common hazard. Magnetic ceiling things. These things attract anything metal towards the ceiling. Amongst the random assortment of metallic detritus collected by these things are... Spiky balls? Spiky platforms that are chained to the floor, and blasters, known as Pon Pon in Japan. These armadillo looking things are modelled on the Hercules Beetle and carry a horn like cannon. Dangerous in their own right, but not really a threat if you have a shield. Despite being obviously circular, these orange and blue balls actually have a square collision box. And even if the ball is spinning like this, it doesn't rotate. If that makes any sense. Basically, you can stand on it and you won't fall off. The small boosters dotted around the floor propel you forward at top speed. They're all safe to stand on, and most of them are required to advance, making them surprisingly useful considering they're based on the technology used to accelerate fighter jets to top speed. Unfortunately, the portal to the anti-gravity bonus stage looks very similar to the slot machine stage. Don't ask me how I got a jackpot. The workings of this thing are so vague it's really not worth mentioning. Besides, this place is only really useful once in the entire game. 
I suppose now is as good a time as any to elaborate on the spiky platforms I mentioned earlier. They are exactly what they sound like, platforms with spikes underneath them. You only find them underneath magnetic ceilings, and they are used to reach higher areas of the level. Painfully obvious, I know, but be careful. Most of them stop short of hitting the ceiling, but some will crush you if you stand on them. Thankfully, the ones that crush you are only a few feet away from the ceiling to begin with, so they're easy to spot. The concept of a spinning spiky thing should be easy to grasp, but the concept of a group of small missiles that are launched about two meters into the air, whereupon they deploy a small parachute and fall back down, and then fart themselves out of existence taking a portion of the ship's hull with them, is a concept I will never really understand. But they open the path forward so I won't ask any questions. Jumping while inside a centrifugal column will allow you to fall down and reach whatever is beneath it. As you can see, underneath this one is a row of animal prisons, three of which are decoys. There is a way you can notice decoy prisons, and I'll tell you how right after the next special stage. Special stage 11 is an OCD nightmare. To complete this stage with a minimum of effort, there are two rules you must abide by. Rule number one. After you collect all the blues in an area and are about to advance to the next one, jump as soon as you collect the last blue. Jump too soon and you'll miss the blue and or collide with the red. Jump too late and you'll overshoot the spring and fall into a sea of reds. Rule number two. Avoid all rings. The rings in this stage were placed there to piss you off to the nth degree. Possibly beyond. Jumping into the centre of these areas to collect the rings is a simple task. Jumping out again is a task best suited to masochists. What I'm trying to say is, it's not worth the effort. Fight your OCD, and your reward is the Blue Emerald. Pretty. Don't be surprised if you don't find many warp rings in this stage. This place is a maze, and the warp rings are hidden in hard to reach corners away from the forward path. But, as I've said before, exploration is your friend. You've no doubt noticed the decoy animal prisons by now. Here's how to spot them. Take a look at the front of the prisons, and you'll notice five black spots. The spots on the decoys are actually diamond shaped. Jumping on these has the same effect as jumping on a spring. The prisons with circular spots contain either six rings, about five animals, or four robots. Or the sub-boss. This week's sub-boss is Gapsule. If you're fighting this thing for the first time, you may have a hard time figuring out how to damage it. It's immune to all direct attacks. Thankfully, this thing has the IQ of a stick and will happily beat the snot out of itself if you stand on its head and run off when it attacks. A truly embarrassing specimen that ends Act 1 practically on its own. Act 2 starts in much the same way Act 1 did. Not much has changed, and to be honest, only a couple of new features can be found here. The small landmines aren't a new feature, but they deserve a mention all the same. Stand on them, and you have about one second to stand somewhere else before they explode. A rather pathetic explosion, but it hurts you. They can also sometimes blend into the background, so pay close attention to what you're standing on. These screw thread columns are little more than a series of moving platforms. The shafts where these things are placed are often lined with spikes, so stay in the centre and wait until you reach the desired level. 
Also, you'll often find a few of them grouped close together, and some can have multiple exits. These small blue mice robots are called Techno Squeak, or Choo Choo if you're Japanese. They move pretty fast, and can be found lurking on the floors, walls and ceilings of both acts. Interesting fact number one. Choo is Japanese onomatopoeia for the sound of a mouse. Interesting fact number two. Techno Squeak and Blaster are both robots that only appear in Sonic and Knuckles, but they are both listed in the manual for Sonic 3, despite not actually being in the game. If you've ever played Sonic 2, you'll recognise this spider as a palette swap of the Grabber robots from the Chemical Plant Zone. However, instead of grabbing you and exploding, these ones grab you and help you cross a chasm, and then drop you onto a bed of mine so you can blow yourself up. These retracting platforms are found in a couple of areas and require skills I don't have to reach the top. Yes, I'm lazy. Deal with it. As I've said before, almost all the levels in this game have multiple paths you can take. But unless you're hunting for warp rings, you shouldn't worry about which path you end up taking. Up ahead is a flamethrower which pulls double duty as a switch. Now I've mentioned before that Dr. Robotnik seems to have a severe case of autophobia. See part 6, the launch base zone, if you don't know what that is. So, the presence of automated guard robots, wall-mounted missile launchers, corridors lined with spikes, crushing traps, landmines, and the labyrinthine layout to the whole area is all somewhat justified. But I begin to question his overall sanity when he starts outfitting the interior of a blimp with flamethrowers. From this, we can deduce that the news of the Hindenburg disaster hasn't reached him yet, or he simply is a demented lardass with no concept of chemical reactions who lied about his so-called 300-point IQ. There's not much else to talk about for this level. Everything from this point on is nothing you haven't encountered before. So I'd like to dedicate a few seconds to satisfying my small fanbase. After my last video, the DBT Gamer, some idiot I can't seem to shake off, I help him with his Let's Plays and Reviews. Feel free to check out his videos, you'll find him in my friends list. He noticed I didn't mention the name of the level boss for the Mushroom Hill Zone. So Dr. Robotnik, could you please tell him what the Mushroom Hill Zone level boss is called? There's no problem at all, that was my Jetmobile. It has no weapons to speak of since I only use it for internet access. If you don't mind, I've got two bosses for this level I need to get ready. Okay, fair enough. And while you're doing that, I need to talk about Special Stage 8. Don't be fooled by the 45 degree orientation of this stage. This is the easiest special stage in Sonic and & Knuckles and as such, nothing to worry about. This stage was designed to introduce the spring balls to the player. As such, none of the spring balls in this stage are required for its completion. They simply provide a quick way of bypassing the star balls. Feel free to take your time with this one and gather the rings if you feel like it. The only thing to watch out for in this level is losing your way and being unable to find the last few blues. Once you get past the psychedelic lime green palette, sit back and enjoy this stage for what it is. A simple puzzle and a welcome break from the chaos of the game. Much like Special Stage 7, the last four constantly elude me. But Perseverance is rewarded with the final Super Emerald of the game, the Green Emerald. <laughs> Incidentally, if you have any questions or if you want me to elaborate on anything, feel free to send me a message or a comment and I'll mention it in the next video. Sonic, old chap, tremble in fear at the deadly laser of my latest invention, the barrier. 
This isn't a new invention. Use the same thing in the Winged Fortress of Sonic 2. Uh, yes, okay, it's not entirely new in the slightest, but this time there aren't any platforms for you to stand on. And this version is made of a high-density metal alloy thingy, which even your patented spin attack won't be able to damage. So I see. Very impressive. Um, I think you just killed the pilot, dude. Hell, bollocks to this. Abandon blimp! And out of character. This area is just a time waster to emphasize the fact that Dr. Robotnik basically just shot down his own blimp from the inside. Follow the path, try not to get crushed and avoid the spikes. Once you reach a dead end, ride the platform up to meet the level boss. Bloody hell, take your time, why don't you? Sonic, we meet again, old chap! This time with a real new invention, the Hangmobile! It's called an imagination, dude, at least give it a try. Never! You can't hurt me while I'm down here and my swing attack can knock you for six! It also gives me a good chance to attack you. Okay, yes. But if you try to stand between my spiky arms, my flamethrower will- You know what? Just shut up. I've got a crap ton of Chaos Emeralds and I'm gonna damn well use them. <laughs> Taste, Taste the, the rainbow, rainbow biatch. biatch! I say, what in the name of Sempty Crap was that? To tell you the absolute gospel truth, I've got no idea. Bloody hell, I'm going to have to leave and think about this one. You do that, you prick. I'll complete Act 2 and say goodbye to this sinking ship. Well, looks like I'm going to have to break that door down. <coughs> oh, my face. Again.